Okay, last class we have uh, seen the use of semaphore variables and uh, we have defined a semaphore variable S which can be only initialized and uh, two operations can be performed on the semaphore variables other than initialization. One is PS operation which is defined like this while S is less than or equal to 0 do skip then decrement S by 1 and the VS operation where S is incremented by 1 and we have also said that both this PS and VS operations they are atomic in nature. And we have seen the use of semaphore variables uh, to solve the mutual exclusion problems where uh, we have taken one semaphore variable, a mutex, which is initialized to a value 1. Then for the critical section problem or mutual exclusion problem, before entering the critical section, in the entry section, you perform P mutex operation and in the exit section, you perform V mutex operation. So, this will give the mutual exclusion uh, property. We have also seen the use of semaphore variables for process synchronization. So, whenever we have a statement, say SJ, which is to be executed only after SI, you use a semaphore variable such thing which is initialized to a value 0. Before execution of SJ, you perform P sync operation and after execution of SI, you perform V sync operation. So, this ensures that SJ can be executed only after SI. So, even if SI and SJ, they are the statements being executed by two independent processes, but because of this P sync and V sync operations, these two processes will be synchronized synchronized at this point. Then we have redefined the operations P and V on the semaphore variables to avoid the busy waiting problem, where instead of having uh, a semaphore to assume only the integer values, we have defined semaphore as a structure having an integer value as well as a list associated with it. So, whenever a process tries to perform P operation, if it finds that the semaphore is not free, that is the value of semaphore is not greater than 0, then the process will be added to the list for that particular semaphore variable and the process will be blocked or the process will go to sleep mode, so that it does not consume any CPU time. The process will be waken up only when some other process performs a V operation on the same semaphore, removes a process from the list and puts that process in the red list. Okay? So, that is how we can avoid busy waiting of the processes in the sense that the process does not consume CPU time unnecessarily. So, let us see how these semaphore variables can be used for different problems with the help of some classical problems, one of them of course we have seen earlier that is a producer consumer problem. We have seen two different solutions of this producer consumer problem earlier. Now, let us see whether we can solve this producer consumer problem using the semaphore variables as well. So, to solve this producer consumer problem, we assume that there are three semaphore variables. One of the semaphore variables is full, other semaphore variables is empty, and the other one is mute x, all these are small variables. <coughs> and as before, we have two other variables, one is next p, other one is <coughs> next c, and they are of type Then we assume that the semaphore variable full is 
is initialized to value 0, empty is initialized to n and mute x is initialized to value 1. So, this is the initialization of all these number variables. Then the producer problem can be written like this, I put it under repeat until false. So, you can write the producer and consumer processes like this. So, whenever a producer process produces an item and wants to put that item into the buffer, firstly the producer process will perform a P empty operation okay. and you find that empty is initially n that means initially all the locations in the buffer are empty, there is no item in the buffer. Because of this P empty operation, whenever this PMT operation is successful, every time the value of the semaphore variable will empty will be decremented by 1. So, you find that in case of a semaphore variable, every P operation on the semaphore variable decrements the value of the semaphore variable by 1. Okay. And after decrementation, if it finds that the value is less than 0, in that case the process will be blocked. So, here also, First, the producer process performs this PMT operation, and because of this, it is quite obvious that the value of this buffer variable empty indicates how many locations in the buffer are free. Okay. So, whenever value of empty 
will come down to 0, that means the buffer is full. Okay. So, if this PMT operation is not successful, in that case we know that the buffer is full, so the producer process cannot put this item into the buffer. So, the produ producer process will be blocked. In case any location in the buffer is free, in that case PMT operation will be successful and the producer process will not be blocked. So, it can put this item which has been produced in next P into the buffer. Okay. So, before putting this item into the buffer, it performs P mutex operation. And this mutex semaphore variable uh, allows only either the producer process or the consumer process to access the buffer at a time. Okay. So, it maintains the mutual exclusion of the buffer. Both producer process and consumer process cannot access the buffer at the same instant of time. So, that is ensured by this mutex semaphore variable, right. So, after that, if P mutex is also successful, this next P, the item will be added, added into the buffer. After that, the buffer will be freed by performing V mutex operation and then by performing V full operation, it will indicate that one more element, one more item has been added to the buffer because V full operation will increment the value of the sum of variable full by 1. Okay. Similarly, for this consumer process, it has to perform P full operation because if the value of this variable full, integer value of this variable full is less than 0, that indicates that there is no element in the buffer to be consumed. So, the consumer process has to be blocked. So, it performs the P full operation. After that, again P mutex and V mutex, this pair of operations ensures that access of the buffer is mutually exclusive. If both of them are successful, both P full and P mutex operations, then only the consumer process will consume an item from the buffer. And after that, by performing V mutex operation, the buffer will be full, uh, buffer will be fed. And finally, by executing this V empty operation, because the consumer process has consumed one item, so one more location in the buffer has been made free. Okay. So, the value of the sum of variable empty will be incremented by 1 by this V empty operation. Okay. So, you find that in addition to the other two solutions that we have discussed earlier, this producer, producer consumer process uh, problem can also be solved by using the sum of variables. Okay. Now, let us take another classical problem. I am discussing all these classical problems because they are common problems in operating system. Okay. So, the next problem that we will discuss is called a reader writer problem. Now, what is this reader writer problem? Here we assume that suppose we have a shared file. Okay. The file can be accessed by a number of reader processes. It can also be accessed by a number of writer processes. Okay. Now, it is quite obvious that we can allow more than one reader process to access the file simultaneously because none of the reader processes are going to modify the content of the file. But if it is a writer process, then the writer process will obviously change the content of the file. So, if there is any writer process accessing the file, no other process, whether it is a reader process or writer process should be allowed to access the file. Okay. So, only one writer process should be allowed to access the file at a time. Whereas, more than one reader process can be allowed to access the file simultaneously. But whenever there is a writer process which is modifying the content of the file, no other reader process or writer process should be allowed to access the file. Okay. Similarly, if there is at least one reader process accessing the file, no writer process should be allowed to access the file. Okay. And this is a common problem and uh, this uh, 
conclusion will also come from the read set and write set that we have already discussed. Okay. So, given this kind of problem, how this problem can be solved by using the semaphore variables. Okay. So, let us try to write the solution. We will assume that uh, we have two semaphore variables, one is the mute x and other one is the right, they are of type semaphore. And we assume that both these semaphore variables mutex and right, they are initialized to a value 1. So, this is the initial value of mutex and right. We use one more integer variable, say read count. So, this read count is an integer variable. And we assume that initially the value of this read count is equal to 0. Okay. So, after this, we can write the codes for the reader process and the writer process like this. For the reader process, first we perform P mute x operation. After that, you increment the read count by 1. Then if read count is equal to 1, then right okay then you perform v mute x then the reader process goes on reading the file then at the end it will again perform v mute x operation decrement the read count So, this will be the structure of a reader process. Similarly, for a writer process, the structure is much simpler. First, it has to perform a P write operation. After P write is successful, it modifies the file that is writes into the file and finally, it performs a V write operation. Now, let us see how this thing works. You find that we have used two semaphore variables, one is mutex and one is write, and there is one integer variable which is read count. Read count is initialized to 0, and both the semaphore variables, mutex and write, they are initialized to value 1. Okay. What does the reader process do? Every reader process will have similar code. Similarly, every writer process will have similar code. Okay. So, reader process first performs p mutex operation. Then within this p mutex v mutex pair, it a reader process modifies or increments the value of read count. Then if read count is equal to 1, then the reader process will perform p write operation. If the read count is not 1, then this p write operation will not be performed. Now, what is the significance of this? I have a number of reader processes. 
every reader process whenever it wants to read contents of the file it has to perform these statements execute these statements first okay now whenever one reader process performs this p mutex operation until and unless it performs the corresponding v mutex operation no other reader process can enter this part okay so the first reader process after performing p mutex operation it will try to modify this read count and will try to perform this if statement okay so before it performs this v mutex operation no other reader process will be able to modify read count or will perform this if statement execute this if, if statement because they will be locked within by this p mutex operation simply because we have initialized p mutex uh, mutex sum of a variable mutex to value 1 okay so this ensures mutual exclusion of these two statements within this p mutex p mutex pair in the essence it ensures that this read count cannot be modified by more than one reader process at a time and you have seen that if we allow more than one reader process to re modify the value of read count followed by this if statement what type of problem we will face okay that we have discussed with respect to our producer consumer problem when we have tried to modify the value of count okay so to ensure the that such a type of such type of problem does not occur this access of this read count variable has been made mutually exclusive and this mutual exclusion is guaranteed by this p mutex p mutex pair okay now let us assume that initially there is no reader process or no writer process trying to access the file okay so first time one reader process is trying to access the file so the reader process will perform this p mutex operation assuming that p mutex is successful because no other process is willing to read the content of the file p mutex is successful so the process is given access to this read count variable and read count is incremented by one our initial value of read count was zero so in this case after incrementing value of read count by one the read count becomes equal to uh, read count becomes equal to one so this process now finds that read count is equal to one so it will perform this p write semaphore operation okay p write will also be successful because initially we have said that there is no other process trying to access this file so p write will also be successful so the process the reader process will perform v mutex operation and starts reading the content of the file in the meantime while this first process is reading the content of the file if there is a second reader process who also wants to read the content of the file so the second pro reader process will perform this p mutex, mutex operation okay because the first process has already executed v mutex so p mutex for the second process will also be successful it increments read count by 1 so now value of read count becomes equal to 2 read count becomes equal to 2 so p write will not be performed by the second process okay it will simply perform v mutex operation and start reading the content of the file so i have two processes reading the content of the same file simultaneously and we said that this won't create problem because none of these processes are going to modify the content of the file okay now what happens if at this point any writer process wants to access the file so the code for the writer process is like this the writer process will perform p write operation here you find that the first reader process who has entered this critical region it has performed a p write operation okay so the writer process which also first performs p write operation it won't be able to execute p write successfully because the corresponding v write has not been executed yet okay so the writer process will be locked on this p write operation right now here you find that since there are two reader processes trying to read the content of the file simultaneously they will also come out one after another 
So the first process to come out will perform p mutex, decrement the read count, it will check what is the value of the read count. If read count equal to 0, then only it will perform V write operation. Okay. Now we have two processes in this critical region. When one process is trying to come out, assuming that P mutex is successful, it will decrement the read count by 1. So now the value of read count will be equal to 1, which is not equal to 0. So the first process to come out of this critical region will not, not perform the V write operation it will simply perform V mutex and come out. So even now, because V write operation has not been performed, the writer process will not wake up. So it cannot enter the critical region. It cannot write into the file. Only when the second reader process also wants to come out, that will also perform P mutex, decrement read count by 1. Earlier value of read count was equal to 1, so now it will be equal to 0. Now, because read count has become equal to 0, so the last process to come out will perform V write operation and then finally V mutex and will come out. Once this V write operation is successful, then only the writer process will, will wake up from, the, from this queue and it can perform this write operation into the file. Okay. So you find that this mutex variable, semaphor variable ensures mutual exclusion of this read count variable. Whereas, this semaphore variable write, it ensures that whenever there is any reader process performing read on the file, no writer process is given access to the file. Okay. However, more than one reader process can read the content of the file. Similarly, if there is any writer process is trying to write into the file, no other reader process or writer process will give an access to the file. Okay. So it is the first reader process to enter this critical region will perform P write operation, ensuring that even if there is at least one reader process, the writer process cannot get access. <coughs> and it is the last reader process to come out of the critical region will perform the write operation. Okay. So the first reader process will perform, first reader process to enter the critical region will perform P write, and the last reader process to come out of the critical region will perform V right. right? So find that such a complex complicated problem where we have to we can allow more than one reader process to be into the critical region simultaneously, but whenever there is any writer process, no other reader process or writer process can be given access to the file. Even such a complicated problem can be solved using this semaphore variables and that shows the power of semaphore variables and the semaphore operations that we have. So this may lead to the starvation of the write processes. Yeah, if we do not have a read uh, semaphore yeah. which is initialized to n whatever the maximum yeah, number is. To. This does not solve the problem of starvation. It only solves the problem of mutual exclusion. Okay. Now, we have assumed that this P mutex operation and V mutex operation, they are atomic in nature. Then one question naturally comes that how to ensure that these operations will be atomic. Okay. So if you go into the Unix operating system, the Unix operating system gives the provision of some of our variables. And it has also have the system calls uh, to perform this P mutex, P mutex operations. Of course, the mnemonics is not really P or V. It has got some other mnemonics. Okay. Using those mnemonics, this P and V operations can be implemented. But again, that is a set of code, a set of instructions uh, used to implement P operation and V operation. But then the naturally the question comes because it is not a single instruction because it is a set of instructions. How do you ensure the atomicity of P operation or v and V operation? Okay. Now, all the operations on the semaphore variables that are done are with the help of system calls. And this system call is a function. And the first thing that is done is whenever the system call is executed, the first instruction within the function is to give the system highest priority for that process. Because that will have highest priority 
no other operation can be performed until and unless the priority of the process comes down. Okay. So, the first statement is to increase the priority to the highest level and the last statement is to reduce the priority. Right. So, though uh, this P and V operations are to be performed by functions, but the atomicity is ensured by changing the priority level. Now, let us discuss about another kind of problem that we uh, get in, uh, in uh, operating systems when we allow more than one processes to be executed simultaneously even in time multiplex fashion. A problem which is known as a deadlock problem. Now, what is this deadlock problem? <coughs> we have seen that the atomic uh, major function of the operating system is to manage the resources of the system, the resources which are to be shared by more than one processes. Okay. And in such a case, we can lead to a problem like this. Suppose we have got two processes in the system, we call these processes P1 and process P2. Okay. And in the system, we have two resources, the so resource A and resource B. A simple situation like this. We have only two processes P1 and P2 and we have only two resources A and B in the system. Okay. P1 for its completion requires both the resources A and B. Similarly, P2 also requires both the resources A and B. And their operations can be complete only when both the resources are available. Until and unless both are available, they cannot complete their operation. Okay? <laughs> and the resources will be released only after completion of the process. Okay. Now we can have a situation like this. Suppose P1 has acquired resource A. So I have resource A. I have resource B, I have the process P1, I also have the process P2. So, I have a situation like this that P1, because it needs both the resources A and B, first suppose it requires resource A and so it has put a request for resource A and it has acquired resource A. Because for its completion, it requires both the resources A and B. So, I have a situation like this that P1 has acquired resource A and in future it will require resource B. For P2, it has acquired the resource B and in future it will require the resource A. And we have also said that P1 will require both the resources for its completion, P2 will also require both the resources for its completion. And P1, once it has acquired resource A, it will not release resource A until and unless it gets B and its job is complete. Similarly, P2, though it has re acquired resource B, it will not release B until and unless it gets A and its job is complete. Okay. So, I have a situation like this that P1 has acquired A and is waiting for the resource B to be free. Because until and unless P2 releases B, P1 cannot acquire it. Okay. Similarly, P2, it has acquired resource B and is waiting for resource A to be released. So, we ha you find that we have a funny situation that P1 has acquired A waiting for B which can be released only by P2 after its completion. P2 has acquired B waiting for A which is to be released by P1 after its completion. Okay. P1 cannot complete until and unless it gets B. P2 also cannot complete until and unless it gets A. Okay. 
So you find that we have a situation that both these processes have acquired some resource and it is waiting for the other resource to be released by the other process which in turn is waiting for another resource which is acquired by the first process. And you find that in this situation neither A will be released by P1 neither B will be released by P2 and they will wait forever in such a cycle and they will never be complete. Okay. So, this is a situation or a problem which is known as a deadlock problem and this is a very common and a serious problem which is to be solved by the operating system because in a system we have a number of processes working independently they ask for different resources as and when they want it. Now, the operating system has to find out that when to allocate which resource to which of the process so that the deadlock will not occur in the system. Okay. <coughs> now, there are various approaches to solve this deadlock problem to ensure that deadlock does not occur in a system because whenever there is a deadlock, it is an wastage. So, to avoid this deadlock problem, the processes or utilization of the resources has to follow some protocol or some rule. The rule is whenever a process wants to use a resource, firstly the process has to put a request for that resource. Okay. Now, if that resource is free, then only the operating system will allocate the resource to the requesting process. Okay. And once the use of the resource is complete, then the resource has to be made free by the process who has requested for it. So, we must follow a sequence that first the process has to request for the resource. After the resource is granted, it has to use the resource and on completion, it has to release the resource. Okay. Now, in order to be able to give the resources to the different requesting processes, the system must know the status of different resources. Okay. That is, which resource is free or which resource is already allocated, if it is allocated to which process it has been allocated. All these informations must be known to the operating system for proper management of the resources. Okay. So, such uh, information or uh, status information of the resources is maintained in a system table. So, whenever any request is made, the operating system refers to the uh, system table to find out the status of that resource and depending upon some criteria, it determines whether the resource can be immediately granted to the requesting process or the requesting process will be asked to wait for some more time <coughs> after which the resource will be allocated. So, it is never guaranteed that even if the resource is free, whenever I want, I put a request and I will get it. That is not guaranteed. Even if the resource is free, I may have to wait uh, until and unless some more resources are made free so that the operating system decides that even if my requests are made in future it won't go into the deadlock. Okay. So, there are some algorithms which are to be followed to ensure that deadlock will not occur. Okay. Now, so this is the sequence in which the resources are to be requested, used and released by the processes. Now, let us say how do you formally define a deadlock. I have just given the concept of deadlock and in which way the resources are to be used. Now, a formal definition of deadlock game can be given like this that a set of processes is said to be in deadlock when every process in the set waits for an event which can only be uh, ensured by other processes in the set. It is a set of processes, okay, I will write it.
so this is the deadlock definition a state of processes is said to be in deadlock when every process in the set waits for an event that can only be caused by another process in the set so in this case what is the event let us come to this p1 is waiting for an event the event is b to be released and this b can be released only by p2 p1 cannot release b similarly p2 is waiting for an event the event is a is to be released and this a can only be released by p1 p2 cannot release a okay so every process is waiting for an event which can only be caused by another process in the set not by the same process okay and that is a formal definition of dead now as we said that it is the responsibility of, of the operating system to see that the deadlock does not occur and the operating system must know what are the reasons which can lead to deadlock or what are the conditions of deadlock okay so if we know the conditions of deadlock then if we can ensure that such conditions will never occur then we can ensure that the deadlock will never occur okay so you have to know that what are the conditions for the occurrence of a deadlock there are four necessary conditions for the occurrence of deadlock the conditions are number 1 is mutual exclusion that is there is at least one resource in the system which cannot be shared by more than one process at a time okay say for example a printer a printer cannot be simultaneously shared by more than one process because in that case the output of different processes will get mixed up and from the print out you will not be able to understand which is what okay so there must be at least one resource in the system which cannot be shared by more than one process so that is mutual exclusion that is the first condition for the occurrence of deadlock second condition for the occurrence of deadlock is hold and wait okay that is the process is holding some resource and waiting for other resources to be released as in this case p1 is holding a and waiting for b to be released that is hold a and wait for b. similarly p2 is holding b and waiting for it. okay so hold and wait is the second necessary condition for the occurrence of deadlock third condition is no preemption that is once a resource is allocated to a process the resource cannot be preempted only the process will voluntarily release it okay so that is the third condition and the fourth condition for occurrence of deadlock is what is called a circular wait of course we can say that this circular wait gives an extension of this hold and wait because it is the hold and wait which leads to circular wait condition but even then it is better to keep them as separate because this will ease our analysis process of deadlock problem and because these are the four necessary conditions for the occurrence of deadlock if we can avoid any of these conditions if we can ensure that at least one of them is not present then we can ensure that the system is deadlock free okay so we'll see more on this in the next class